I'm appreciate being asked to preach at this every year, and I don't just consider it a foregone conclusion, but I consider it an honor and a privilege to come here and to be a part of this ministry, to uh, bring the Word of God, rightly divided. That's something I had settled in my mind quite a few years ago, and I think if you're here, you probably had that also. Uh, we haven't been able to spend the week here as we have in other years because of you know, issues at home. My wife sends her greetings to those of you that know her and everyone else. You should know her. Uh, this morning my message is about inheritance, and inheritance implies a what? If there's an inheritance, then what? Somebody had to die, right, <laughs> for that to become an issue. Uh, you know, sometimes in families, when you have inheritance, uh, there's always, not always, many times, trouble, right? Issues. People think whatever, that they should get something, you know, mom wanted me to have that couch type of thing. And I've seen that happen. Uh, it never happened in my family, actually. In 1999, my stepmother passed away, and the house she lived in with my dad, who had passed uh, away earlier, became vacant, and the house was sold in Elk Grove Village, Illinois, when my dad bought that house in like the end of the 50s, that was considered to be way out in the boondocks, you know, west of O'Hare Field somewhat. And when that house was sold back at that time in the 1990s, 1999 or so, that was like, you know what they say about real estate, location, location, location. That was like prime a uh, prime spot in Elk Grove Village, Illinois, and the house just, bam, it sold like not, nothing, you know. Uh, so when the house was sold, then the money that was acquired from the sale of the house, the proceeds were divided up between me and my siblings. That was my inheritance. So you understand what that means, right? So the Bible, in the Bible, inheritance actually is a big deal. Uh, you remember what Jacob did? to try to get his brothers part of the inheritance. That's the kind of stuff that goes on in these family situations where somebody thinks they're shortchanged or they didn't get as much as they should have or whatever the issue. Uh, so Jacob did some kind of underhanded shady stuff to get some things from his brother, brother that he technically really didn't have coming. So my assignment is to talk about the inheritance of Israel and of the body of Christ. Uh, inheritance in the world to come. So we'll start talking about Israel. Turn over in your Bible to Genesis chapter 15, verse 7, and we'll look at some verses about this. Genesis chapter 15, verse 7. You have here in this chapter God talking to Abraham. God called Abraham out of Ur the Chaldees and, and told him to go to a place that he would show him. Let's pray before we really get any further. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word and pray that as we open it, study it, look at it this morning, you would give us understanding into what you said. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. So he says to Abraham here, uh, he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees I, to give you this land to what? Inherit it. So Abraham leaves his home. He travels to another location, and God promises that he will give Abraham and his descendants that land. And we know where that land is, don't we, today? And there's still all kinds of problems going on over in that part of the world, right? It just seems to be like a hotbed of, you know, problems, issues, all kinds of things going on over there. But did God did promise that to Abraham. If you believe the Bible to be true and you believe what God says in his word, then you would have to come to the conclusion that the descendants of Abraham were given that land and not anybody else, right? Uh, look over in Psalm chapter 37. Psalm 37, verse 11. And here it says, you'll know this verse, I think. It says here, 
Psalm 37, 11. But the meek shall inherit the earth. You've heard that expression some other place, right? In uh, There's that famous sermon in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, right? And Jesus is actually quoting this verse. That's because that context, that setting, that message is talking to the nation Israel and is still involving the fulfillment of promises that God made to Israel. And it's not really the message for the body of Christ, is it? There's a prayer in there. Have any of you seen this movie, uh, Paul the Apostle of Christ, that was just out in the theaters? Did anybody see that? You're probably better off if you haven't, actually. <laughs> I, I saw, I watched it, I had no expectation at all of anything, uh, and I was pretty much right about that, but one of the things they have in there, Paul's praying the Lord's Prayer. It's like, oh, wow. I was like kind of, well, I'm not surprised. I mean, that's what, it kind of shows you what, I'm assuming that the people that made that were Christians, you know, or they wouldn't make a movie about someone like that in that manner. I mean, there were some, it was kind of nice to see peoples from the Bible that you knew the names of and see them kind of, you know, brought to life in a sense. But uh, it shows you the state of the church in general if that's what they think that Paul would have been praying. And I, it's really kind of a sad commentary, actually. There's actually been a lot of Christian movies made recently, and some of them have been really silly, you know. Uh, that probably falls in that category, actually. Uh, this verse, the meek shall inherit the earth, I mean, it is a promise to Israel, and it has to do with what God is going to do for them. Look at Isaiah chapter 57, verse 13. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 13, and it says here, When thou criest, let thy companies deliver thee, but the wind shall carry them away, vanity shall take them away. But, but, he, but he that putteth his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. See, more verses, more statements about the land and inheriting Israel is going to inherit the earth. Israel, or, and Israel is going to inherit specifically that that piece of property that is in the Middle East today. Uh, Matthew chapter twenty-five, verse thirty-four. Matthew chapter twenty-five, verse thirty-four. And this is uh, this dividing of the sheep and the goat nations, the saved and the unsaved. These are Gentile nations in the regarding they enter into the kingdom or not enter into the kingdom regarding uh, their treatment of Israel during the tribulation period when the Abrahamic covenant is back in force. And, you know, God says, I'll bless those that bless you and not bless those, you know, that don't bless you. So he says, uh, verse 34, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. There's a lot of things you could talk about on that verse, but the thing I'm focusing on here is that he, it's an inheritance, and it has to do with a kingdom, and it has to do with inheriting physical possessions on the earth, land. So there's, there's lots of passages when you start talking about this kingdom, there's lots of passages, or there's some passages anyway at least, that describe what that kingdom will be like in a physical way. We're not going to really turn to look at those passages, but you, you could think of Isaiah 2 and Isaiah 11. It talks about the wolf lying down with the lamb. It talks about the child putting his his hand on the cockatrice den, talks about uh, they shall beat their swords in the plowshares. There's something about the, the reapers following the sowers in the fields. And there's, you know, things like that. It, when that kingdom finally comes, then the, the 
the earth is going to be blessed, the curse is going to be removed, uh, and death and sickness will pretty much be banished from the, the earth at that time. There's another aspect about this inheritance. Look over in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, start at verse 18. It says, uh, Luke 18, 18, And a certain ruler asked him, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So in the Jewish understanding of eternal life, it's not exactly the same as the way we kind of think about it. For us, eternal life is mostly a spiritual concept, right? Then you trust Christ as your Savior, and when you did that, then you got eternal life, that God did some things for you, and one of those things was to give you, give you eternal life. But for the Jewish person living at the time of Christ, that idea of eternal life would have been wrapped up like a hand in a glove with the idea of the kingdom. So he says, this fella says, uh, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? This is a great passage of Scripture and, and Christ interacts with this, this guy, and he says, uh, verse 20, thou, that, thou knowest the commandments. <coughs> Let's start at 19. Jesus said, Why callest thou me good? There is none good that, uh, but one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he, and he said, the fellow responding, uh, all those things I, ha I have kept from my youth. Christ doesn't call him a liar. Uh, we know from the Sermon on the Mount that when God said some things like thou shalt not kill, he meant more than just physically doing it, you know, that the, the, to murder somebody, it usually is the result of hate, <laughs> right? And, and so there's a process that leads to those things, but this fellow says that he had done those things and he, then, so he says, I've done those things, verse 20, 22, that when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, uh, yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. So he tells this guy, who evidently was pretty wealthy, he says to him, sell your possessions, and then take the proceeds of that, I didn't follow that advice when my parents' house was sold, you know. I didn't do that. I'll, I'll confess I didn't do it. I took and I invested the money, and then a few years later, you know, I invested it in mutual funds or something, and then the stock market crashed, and a lot of it was gone. <laughs> you know, that happens. <laughs> Unfortunate, but it happens. And you've probably if you've been in Christian circles around teachers, preachers in most churches, they'll say Christ didn't really mean for this guy to do that. And I'll ask you, did Christ really mean for him to do it? Yeah, yeah he did. And the guy, obviously it was a test for the guy because he didn't want to do that. He, he had a lot of money Verse 23, and when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And then he talks about, with the disciples, about a rich person getting into heaven. Let's skip down to verse 27. He said, These thing, he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, how do I know Christ really wanted that fella to sell his possessions and give the money, the proceeds of that sale to the poor? How do I know that's true? And I'm telling you, if you hear a preacher on the radio say he didn't really mean for him to do it, then you should just turn that guy off. He's not worth listening to. How do I know that he did want him to do that? Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. Peter's a very pragmatic person. He says, he sees this interaction, and he's thinking, hmm. I've already done that. <laughs> so he says, we've done that. What are we going to get? And verse 29, he said unto him, Verily I say unto you that 
There is no man that hath left home, left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, which will not receive, receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. See, the world to come for the Jewish people, for Israel, is that kingdom on the earth that had been promised and prophesied that Christ had come to be the king of, and, but first he had to do what? Before he could do that, what did he have to do? Or before that could happen, what did he have to do? That's an easy question. He had to die. See, with inheritance, there's always a death, right? But this person died, but he didn't stay dead. Then he was resurrected. And the new covenant, which Morris was talking about, the new covenant couldn't really go into effect until after Christ died, could it? There had to be the death of a testator. And so the new covenant that was promised to them in Jeremiah 31 and there's a parallel passage to that in Ezekiel 36. And one of the provisions of the covenant in 36 is the return to the land and that they'll be dwelling in the land in peace and that God would take the stony heart out of them and put a heart of flesh and write in that heart his law and give them the internal motivation to do all the things that he, he wanted them to do. So... <clears throat> that all has to do with that inheritance that God had promised them in the kingdom. So let's see, turn the page here. So if you're going to talk about eternal life in the kingdom on the earth, there's a couple other verses here we'll look at. Daniel chapter 12. So we, we, we rightly emphasize the distinction Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, we rightly emphasize the distinction between the body of Christ and Israel, and our inheritances are different, but there are some similarities between them as well. So you have here in the end of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, start at verse 2, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting, uh, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. But they that, shall, they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn away to turn, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So if there's a resurrection and then these righteous people, the saved people, they shine as the stars, what has to happen to them? They're resurrected and there also has to be a what? To their body. It has to be transformed, right? Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 43. Matthew 13, 43, he says, this is very similar to the verse in Daniel, and then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears let him hear. So there's got to be, for that to happen, there's got to be some kind of a transformation or change of their bodies, right? Because, well, they're resurrected, some of them are resurrected, Somebody, I believe, is talking about when, when Christ returns and at the second coming, there are some people who are alive in physical bodies who are the saved people. Only saved people go into the kingdom, right? Some of them, there are some people who are resurrected to go into the kingdom, and then there are those people who are alive when Christ returns and physically go into the kingdom in a physical body that I don't believe get this glorified body yet. And they're having children in the kingdom period of time, and they still have a fallen physical human body. Now, Satan has been bound for a thousand years, so there's not the 
kind of things going on today, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of trashy stuff going on today. You know about that, right? That's not going to happen. You know, you, you've ever said that, talked to anybody, and they, you say, the, talk about the kingdom, and they say, well, we're in the kingdom, or it's a spiritual kingdom. And my response to that is, hey, haven't you ever watched the news? <laughs> because if this is the kingdom we're in today, God really messed it up. The kingdom, when it finally does come, as prophesied, is going to be nothing like the world today, even though it is on planet Earth physically for a thousand years. So Christ reigns for a thousand years on Earth. These people who go into that kingdom in physical bodies are having children. So there's children born in physical human bodies that still really have an old sin nature. But in that time, there's pretty severe punishment for disobedience and there's people, even with Christ reigning on the earth, there's people just going through the motions by rote of a religion and they don't really have a genuine relationship. They haven't really put their faith in Christ and God and we know that's true because when Satan's released at the end of the thousand years, he goes and he gets, it says there, the, the people that encompass the city are like the sand of the sea. It really shows what humans are really like, that they could live in a perfect, idyllic setting, having not wanting or lacking anything, all their needs fulfilled and more, and still could be deceived into thinking that Christ is bad and try to overthrow that. That just kind of blows my mind. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. <clears throat> this is the parallel passage to the one in Luke 18, verse 27, the same incident with the rich young ruler. And Peter, then Peter answered and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? There it just, Peter says, well, What am I getting? <laughs> and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration. You see, the regeneration for Israel is not the same thing as for the body of Christ. Now, there is a spiritual rebirth, I'm certain of that, but their regeneration comes when the kingdom is come and instituted. So he's saying, uh, ye that... Ye that which follow me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So you see, for them, their inheritance involves a, a, a land, and it also involves a glorified body, eventually. It, but it's still a future thing for them, but it's still a future thing for us, right? Now, so the inheritance of the body of Christ. Now, we are not the nation Israel. We are the body of Christ. The body of Christ does not replace Israel. We are a separate and distinct entity and group from the nation Israel. We have a destiny that's different than Israel's destiny. <clears throat> we are destined not to reign on the earth, but to reign in heavenly places with, with Christ. So turn to Ephesians chapter 1. So it's not the same, but there are some similarities, as I think you'll see. This is uh, Ephesians, Ephesians 1 is just a fabulous chapter. If you turn this chapter into your English teacher in high school, you would not pass. And be R O R O R O R O, right? That's okay. I'm not complaining. I'm actually happy about what's here. <laughs> uh, Ephesians 1, verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. So, see, we have an inheritance also. We have something to look forward to that is a great thing. So he says again, in whom we have, obtain, ab, have obtained an inheritance. So when you see the, the word, the phrase, in whom, 
what's, who's that talking about? Jesus Christ, right? The phrase, in whom, occurs seven times in the book of Ephesians, and every time it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom you have blessings and all these wonderful things, and one of those things is that we have an inheritance. Now, we have obtained an inheritance that we didn't have before. Let's go back to the verse. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. So if you've obtained something, it means that you didn't have that at a previous point in time, right? So it's like uh, you've acquired it. You've gotten it. It's become something that you had that you previously didn't have. So when you trusted Christ, and he talks about in verse 13 and in verse 12, he talks about how it was you obtained it. You, you trusted Christ as your Savior. You put your faith in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Somebody came to you or you heard it someplace along the way and somebody shared the gospel with you. It's, it is the word of God, right? The gospel that saved your soul, that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again, and you recognized or realized you needed that, that you couldn't do it, that you were a sinner, and you trusted in what Christ did for you, and then you, at that moment in time, you obtained something. There's other things that happen too, you know. <laughs> but you obtained an inheritance that you didn't have before that point in time. In whom, also, in whom also we have obtained, so in Christ we have obtained an inheritance. An inheritance, this, this is a, a glorious future that we are a part of. Our future glorification with Christ, which we'll talk about in a minute here, so there's, there's maybe some several aspects to this inheritance, but I would say, that the main aspects, the main things about it is, are that you, you have obtained a position in this future governmental authority of the Lord Jesus Christ in heavenly places, and you also, which you haven't obtained it yet, but you will obtain it, and that is to be glorified like the Lord Jesus Christ is glorified, to have a body like unto his glorious body. Now this verse Ephesians 1.11, it says, in whom, ye, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him. So it's something, now, this predestination, it's not an individual thing. It's a corporate thing that God had in eternity past. That's a long time ago, isn't it? <laughs> that God had purpose to do something and set out to do something in eternity past and one of the things that he determined he would do would be that those people who placed their faith in the gospel and trusted Christ that he was going to put them into this position where they would be glorified and in this governmental authority in the universe Amen. but it's not that God chose you predestined you or me you know, if this is what your thinking is about this, then you should stop thinking that way. <laughs> if you fall into that camp, which I think most of Christendom falls into, then you can't really even be certain that you're saved. You know, when they talk about the... Uh, the tulip and the perseverance of the saints, which is the last little point there, that's not eternal security, the way we understand eternal security. That's saying that the saints persevere, but you wouldn't know that until you were dead. And then it would be too late. There's no points of the tulip that you should be, you know, adhering to. 
So he says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated. So God, God did predetermine that those people who by their free will, if God didn't give people free will, then this is all just a joke. It's a big, God has really pulled a fast one on you, if that were the case, on all of humanity. But he says here, predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And that statement actually kind of blows me away. God is going to work out everything. He has set a purpose in eternity past. He decided he was going to do some things, and he set a purpose, and he set a way to accomplish those things to be done, and he's going to pull it off in spite of the fact that he gave humans free will. That is a great God. That he doesn't need to manipulate the circumstances or set things up ahead of time so things turn out the way he thinks they or wants them to turn out. But he says, you can go and try <laughs> to do what you think, but you know, I'm going to accomplish what I set out to do. That's a big God. The other God is a little God. So he says here, once again... In whom, we have, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who, ha, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So God had a purpose. And I, I want you to skip down, if you would, to verse 18, where it talks about inheritance again, but it says something a little bit differently there. It says it a little differently there. The eyes of your understanding. It's interesting to me, Paul, uh, Paul lays out these wonderful things in Ephesians 1, from 3 to like verse 14. And then the next thing he goes into is he is praying for the Ephesians. And I would say he's praying for you and me as well, that we would understand these things. Because it's not going to work if you don't understand, at least for you personally, it's not going to work if you don't understand it. In Colossians 2, I think it's 2 or 3, he talks about the full assurance of understanding. I mean, wow! That how many Christians, I mean, really saved Christians, waffle around and they're full of doubt and, oh, I don't know if I even trusted Christ. I don't know. I really need to, you know, get baptized again to make sure the deal was good. And you know, any, any of you been baptized more than once because you weren't sure that you really trusted Christ and maybe that didn't work? You don't need to do that. The full assurance of understanding so you can understand some things that should bring stability to you. He says, and so he prays this prayer that in verse 18, I'm just going to break in here. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now here he's talking about the inheritance of Christ. So you see, part of your inheritance as a member of the body of Christ, as a believer in the age of grace, is that you get to be put into these positions of authority in God's governmental system sometime in the future and then you become a part because that's Christ's inheritance to gain that authority back to himself, those positions of authority and that governmental structure. That is the inheritance of Christ. But you become a part of his inheritance, or let's say your inheritance becomes a part of his inheritance because God is using you as members of the body of Christ to gain back his inheritance. That's pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 17. <clears throat> Let's just start at 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby ye cry, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. One of the ministries of the Holy Spirit today is to take these things and to make them real to you. As you take the Word of God in, you understand what you have in Christ. You have the Holy Spirit who it says in verse 13 of Ephesians, or is it 14 of Ephesians 1, that you're sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. The day of redemption is the day when this inheritance becomes an actual physical reality for us. Uh, verse 17, if children then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. That's a phenomenal statement, isn't it? And then he talks about, if so be that we suffer with him, we may, that we may also be glorified together. And I'm just looking at the context of Romans 8, and it seems to me, if he's talking about suffering there, then in verse 18 he says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, he's talking about the sufferings that you suffer because you're living in a world cursed by sin. That's what it talks about there. God's not out to get you. He didn't give you a flat tire because he's mad at you, you know. <laughs> when something bad happens to you, don't say, what are you trying to teach me, God? You live in a world cursed by sin. God didn't say, he didn't exempt you from the bad effects of that. So we're joint heirs with Christ, glorified together in Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. Now, we looked at some verses and about Israel having bodies that were glorified and shining as the stars of heaven. Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. I'll start at verse 24. Our conversation is in heaven, from whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. You see, that is what we're all waiting for, isn't it? And if you're like over 60, you know, <laughs> then you, you progress on through life and you get older and you have more physical problems, don't you? You have issues you didn't have when you were 20. Morris was talking about that, wasn't he? He can't lift that tractor wheel anymore, I think that's what he said. I don't know if I could have ever lifted that, but. <laughs> <laughs> when you're a young guy, I was working in this gym. I know it doesn't look like I ever worked in a gym, <laughs> but this gym was kind of different. It was, the machines were hydraulic machines. And guys would come in and they would want to know about the gym and they would see the equipment and they would just like, it was young guys, you know, they would just, ah, this, you know, because these macho young studs, like they want to, they want to lift the weights, right? They want, it's just, they don't realize that when they're like, you know, 60 years old that <laughs> they're not probably going to be really thinking about that much anymore, right? Your physical body's wearing out. So we wait for the day when it will be changed. Who shall change our vile bodies that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So there's a day in the future, and I don't know when it will be. We can't really determine when it will be, as Alan was saying. There's no way to determine. There's no event to look at to say you know, oh, it's coming soon. Ever since I've been saved, I've been hearing, oh, Christ is coming soon. And I was saved in the 70s, and there was a book, The Late Great Planet Earth, you know, and wow, I mean, I was all excited. I read that book, and I was all excited, you know. Well, and the year was 1988, because that was 40 years after Israel was reborn as a nation. Well, you know, 1988 came and went. And every other day it's come and gone. So, I mean, you would think people would like, 
what am I wasting my time on this for? But they don't. Now, let's go back to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1.11 comes after verse 10. Duh. But in verse 10, actually all these statements in the first chapter just kind of flow one into the next, right? But he says in verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth. So you see, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, right? And then the shift is away from heaven to the earth. And then the whole, pretty much the whole Old Testament is taken up with what's going to happen or what is happening on the earth, right? And you don't really find out about the heaven part of it until you get over here into Paul's epistles. And, and it, God had a purpose. And his purpose was to bring back all of this authority in the universe, the heaven and the earth, back to himself and to put it back under his reign and his governance because there's been a rebellion in those realms. So in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in Christ, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, you become part of what God said he was going to do in reclaiming in this future governmental authority, and you become a part of what he's doing in the dispensation of the fullness of time to reclaim the heaven and the earth back to himself, and we become a part of that. I don't know. That's a pretty good deal. You know, when the family start fighting about the inheritance and, you know, oh, and he got too much and he got this thing and that should have been my thing and all these kind of squabbles, there's no fighting about this inheritance. There's enough to go around. Yeah. Everything, as I said, is going to work out exactly as God has intended it to do. Our God is a great God. And you become blessed to become a part of that. Wow. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Paul's meeting with the Ephesian elders. He's on his way to Jerusalem, and he meets with the elders at the, of the church at Ephesus, to whom the book of Ephesians is written. And he says, this is a great portion of Scripture. He says in verse 32, he's kind of concluding this at this point. He says, now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. The word of his grace. Now, look, back, look up in verse uh, 24 at the end of the verse. He talks about the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel, the grace of God. Paul was the apostle of grace, was, was he not? If you want to go in the Bible and you want to find out about God's grace, where in the Bible would you look for that information? You would find it in Paul's epistles. There's, there's no greater revelation of what God's grace is and what it means in its many facets than in Paul's epistles. So, he says in verse 32 again, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So the word of his grace, it does two things. It can build you up, right? And we're all about edifying the saints, are we not? But it also gives you an inheritance that you have a future that's a great future because you trusted Christ as your Savior. God builds you up. He edifies you. Grace should help you be able to cope with life when you have problems, concerns, issues, things are going wrong. But it also gives you an inheritance. <coughs> God had a vast plan that he purposed in himself in eternity past to accomplish 
And you get to be a part of that. I say, oh, wow. And the really great thing also is to be a part of a group of believers that see those things and know about them. That you're not like just wandering around like Israel in the wilderness. Oh God, why about this and why about that and all these things people say and do. So I mentioned there's differences, but there are similarities in this sense. And we'll close with this. They have an inheritance of a governmental authority of the earth and they have a glorified body. We have an inheritance of governmental authority in the heavens, and we have a glorified body. So in that sense, they're similar. All of this we have because Jesus Christ died and rose again, and we put our faith and trust in that work for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for what you've done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you've given us all these wonderful blessings, and we have a great future, future, we just thank you for these things. In Christ's name, amen.